Hey, everybody, welcome back. Episode number three of Matrix Mash. I'm Emily Moyer, and with me is my good friend, Robert Phoenix. And we have to do more Kevin nonsense. Robert, how you doing? I'm great. And of course, we're joined by Jasper. You say Jasper. hi, Jasper, to everybody. <laughs> Jasper, the media cat. Hey, it's great to be back, Emily. And uh, Sorry you know, we missed last week, guys, but there was lots of news to pay attention to and lots of things going on. So we're back. <laughs> and there's a lot more news to sort of accrue for the news cycle and yeah. uh, more pieces to dissect. And if you're, if you, the only way you're not hearing about Christine Blasey Ford and, and uh, Brett Kavanaugh is if you're living under a rock, a black rock. Oh, that's a hint. <laughs> so where we're taking this tonight, we're dropping in a little early. You see, that's called predictor programming. Yeah. That's what's going on here. <laughs> we the game within the game and you got to, you got to pay attention. So, <laughs> There's a ton going on, and the whole theater on Friday was absolutely and utterly bizarre. So just to get people kind of up to speed in, in the moment, right, on Friday, they brought Christine Blasey Ford in from California to sit before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and that's where the vetting was taking place for Brett Kavanaugh. They were going to vote for Brett Kavanaugh to be nominated so he could go to the Senate floor. Okay, that's a whole other process now. And what took place during that time is unlike anything I've ever seen. It was one of the most bizarre events that um, I've witnessed. It was really, truly, utterly strange. So we were greeted by Christine Blasey Ford, who was, for all intents and purposes, about a 12-year-old girl. It was so weird. I mean, everybody commented that, number one, she sounded like a little girl. Mm -hmm. She looked like a little girl. Um, it, was, it was completely resonant with what I think you and I would consider her programming. Yep. So, uh, again, uh, just to give people some background, uh, Christine Blasey Ford has really deep CIA uh, family connections, FBI family connections. Uh, banking connections. She is a classic kind of blue blood uh, a girl from Washington, D.C., who is probably brought in at some level, uh, perhaps even maybe against her will when we look at her background. And there's a very strong possibility that what we were watching on Friday was full on MK Ultra trigger trauma programming. Mm hmm. Now, when she talks about not remembering how she got to a party, who she was with at a party, um, how she got home, where the party was, or what the date was, that may actually be true. Mm -hmm. She may not be lying. She may not remember these things for, uh, for the reason that she could have been programmed during that time. Yep. Or she could have even been programmed after the fact. Yep. So we're, we're on very tenuous and very shaky ground here. Yep. And as a witness, clearly she was shaky. I, I, I read the, uh, uh, the was, who, is it Rachel Mitchell, the woman who was... Yeah, who questioned her. Yeah. yeah. And basically she came up with at least 10 bullet points which disqualify her as a credible witness. And she's probably, you know, everybody's got an affiliation. You're either a Republican or a Democrat or you're, you know, you're somewhere in that mix, and she's a Republican, but she says this is not a, a bipartisan issue. And I watched her, and I thought she was very fair in a lot of ways with Christine Blasey Ford, although she did get her to admit that she's got this, you know, basically phony travel phobia. Right. And, and, uh, and that was actually pretty, I think, good clever uh, on her part. So... This is kind of where we are now. There was that strange scene where Jeff Flake does this weird theater and gets up and goes and finds his buddy Coons, who's sitting over on the Democratic side, says, come on, let's go. And then they go through those mirror doors that they have, which are it's very strange. Right? Right? Yeah. yeah. And there's actually an interesting geometric shape, like a, like a square. I don't know if you... Notice that in the background, and then there's the number eight uh, the, that's there. Very interesting. Right. Okay. So they go through there, and, you know, 
there's, this was there's, during the hearing. I wasn't watching the hearing. I watched select clips after. This was you, during the hearing. That's right, during the hearing. So all the Democrats leave. Mirror walls mean a lot symbolically with uh, trauma-based mind control. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, so what this is, a lot of this is starting to sound like to me, ha like reminds me of, you know, what the original sort of forward-facing story about MKUltra was, was that they would use this, they would send uh, prostitutes in to uh, drug men, and they would be behind double fa double pane mirrors, right? Like that, they said, and these w women were try supposed to try and get them to admit stuff. Like these were the tests to see if it would work to use for interrogations and dealing with the Soviets and if, all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, that is a part of MK Ultra, but that's like the part that, like, you know, that's the forward facing part that everybody now knows about, right? So there's that, but also when you said double mirror, in fact, I was just having this conversation with somebody, it was either this morning or yesterday morning, that, you know, br shattered mirrors or even mirrors, like if they're like tiled mirrors, mirrors where there's like, you'll see multiple images of yourself, right? That is a huge part of, of you know, trauma-based mind control. It's part of alters, it's separate, it's seeing different versions of yourself. Trying to think right now what the eight imposed on that could mean. I mean, like, heck, obviously, there's, like, the possibility of infinity. There's 88 programming. There's all kinds of stuff. I don't know what it means in this sense, but I do find there to be some level of significance. And even I'm wondering what, I mean, what is the condition of Jeff Flake and this Coombs guy, right? Were they triggered to, like, go in the elevator? And, you know, like, I, what is going on? Well, it was just Flake in the elevator. Right, okay. And then what happens with Flake is he gets harangued by these two young women who are on the elevator and a third who happens to be a, a big activist from Queens. Mm -hmm. where, where did we hear about Queens? Right. Serena Williams. Serena Williams. Right. She's the queen of Queens. That's right. We could talk a little bit more. I had some insight into that too. Okay. Me too. We, I had into, we can get into that a little bit. Um, so he, you know, it's the down elevator and, and there's that sort of reference to Prince and right. There's purple involved, and well, weren't they all wearing purple ties too? And that they was were. Purple, the purple and pur revolution. The purple rain, the purple rain, the purple revolution, the purple right. Niagara Falls. America right. is falling, right? That's like, right. Yeah. yeah. There's all sort. I mean, there. It's almost like, just to quote you from the other night, their kitchen sink in it. Yeah, they are Ab absolutely, and uh, and they're showing us that this is George Soros's purple revolution. Mm-hmm. This is the color revolution where we've seen like the, you know, the, the, the orchid revolution, the rose revolution. We've seen all these different colors. This is the purple revolution. Yeah. And it is, um, it's certainly um, symbolic and a sign that, that that's, that's what's going on. So he comes back out of that elevator visibly shaken and comes back through the double mirror doors. And then he has his little moment with, Coons, and then that's when they decide that they're going to. Oh, have... so that happened after the elevator. Yes. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yes. Um, so they did that, and it's all a complete and utter stagecraft. Mm -hmm. They were going to do this regardless. This is where yeah. this was headed. It wasn't as if Jeff Coons had a moment. It was all staged. All that was yep. staged. The cameras were there, right? How are the cameras there? And how is it like this? Is, and this is where I go into like the cameras. And this is where I go into like how controlled is everything? Are we in a simulation? How can it be that his name is Flake? That's like Anthony's last name being Wiener, right? Like that's like right. Like it's just like it's very interesting. Right, right? and also one of Brett Kavanaugh's best friends and somebody who's considered kind of a judge. key witness with all this is Mark Judge. Right, Mark right. the Judge. Yeah, Mark the Judge. Bizarre stuff, utterly bizarre stuff. So that was just that was just a, a little bit of theater. Yeah, so, because they were going to take well, this to the FBI no matter Blazy what. Blazy Ford, right? And Blazy Ford, Blazy like a fire of Ford theater, right? Like all this kind of like what? It, it, they're really kitchen sinking it. It really, they really are. Like it's mm -hmm. all these, you know, all this terminology, all these words, all these names, all these colors, all this symbology. Like what is this? And you know, yeah. you know, but you know what this is, you know, and I mentioned this to you the other day, and I think this is 
a huge part of it. We've, we're, you and I were just talking before we came on the air about how there's always multiple reasons for stuff, right? Hey, guys, what happened to Russian collusion? Anybody remember that? This has become such a shit show so quickly, and this is going to go on for so long and get to such a deep and crazy level, right, that by the time it's over, the Mueller probe will be dissolved, and nobody will ever remember that there was Russian collusion. The media can just skip along like they never wasted two years of our time talking about that. Right. Absolutely. Okay, so I want to bring up this image um, that's inside the Senate Judiciary. I'm going to pop it up here because it's, it's actually kind of worth having a look at. Let me see if I can grab it. Sometimes uh, it's one of these. All right, let me do a screen grab here. Hold on one second. Um, but it's worth, it's definitely worth, oh, come on. Me doing the thing with just had it. Um, give me one second. Okay. One of the things, while well, I'm scuffling to try to find this, one of the things that was really interesting was the fact that Patrick Leahy was in that room. Do you know who Pat Leahy is? Yeah, uh, the name sounds familiar. He's a, he's a senator, isn't he, or a congressman? Oh, he's more than a senator and a congressman. He is way more than a senator. So let me just grab this image here, and then I'll, I'll be able to connect some dots. Give me one sec. Here we go. All right, so I'm gonna do a little share screen with you so people can check this out. And Okay, can you see that? Yes. This is the Senate Judiciary. Check out, check yep. out that wow. image on that back door. Yeah, wow. Okay, so we have three squares. They're all stacked, right? Yeah. And then we have this thing that looks like a DNA code. Yeah, I was just gonna say, this looks like DNA. These, these are DNA, these are, these are pyramids. These are, there's, you know, snaky looking stuff in there. There's right. targets, there's yep. targets, yep. there's bullseyes. Mm -hmm. There's boxes inside of boxes. There's X marks the spot. I mean, this, this is just loaded, loaded. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is one door. Then off to um, the left over here or the right, if you're facing where Chuck Grassley would be sitting right by that mic, that's where the mirrored doors are, just okay. over here to that, to that side. Gotcha. But, th but, th but this, G th this, this column. You really grab my attention. Each box is slightly different than the other box. That's right. They're not the same. They're not exactly the same, but they, at the first, you, it takes you a minute to sort of sort that out. Mm -hmm. Like on the top one, the, uh, the, the circle in the middle is not as, is, is prominent. The boxes that are around the circle are different in each one. It says very, I mean, the, it is an optical illusion as well. It's confusing. It almost seems like whoever would walk out that door after would almost have their mind wiped and forget what they just talked about. You know, quite possibly. I mean, I, ha I, I didn't spend a lot of time really breaking this down, but I thought, well, why couldn't they just have just a regular door? Right. You know, there, there's nothing, there's no, there's no mistakes. Like, that's no there mistake. for a reason. Yep. It, it almost feels like, you, you know, the, these are almost like portals to Saturn in some ways. Yes. Because we're going to wind up talking a little bit about Saturn, and Saturn is – the hypercube, and we have like these hypercubes. Those are hypercubes right there. Right there that are stacked, right? Yeah. Um, and the judiciary chamber is, it is a, it is a chamber of Saturn because, because this is where it's all about judgment. Order. Law and order and law time. Law and order judgment. and judgment and time. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. So anyway, I thought that that would be something that people would find interesting just from a, a visual perspective. Yep. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to read. What were you going to say about Pat Leahy? Well, that's what I want to read. Okay. okay. So if people are familiar with Kathy O'Brien, mm -hmm. who is one of the, the poster girls for MK Ultra, And if you haven't read the transformation of America, I highly recommend it. If you're interested in this material and you really want to understand how the, the, the breakdown of the human mind occurs on a personal level when somebody is pulled out when they're young it continually mm -hmm. triggered and traumatized or traumatized and triggered over the course of a lifetime this book is for you however i will give you 
a fair warning. There is a lot of graphic uh, imagery and descriptions mm -hmm. about what is done to her daughter, who is very young. And I can handle a lot of material. But after three quarters of the way through this book, I had to put it down. Because, yeah. of, because after a while, you just get oversaturated. And th there's some heavy sledding in it. But the other thing that's really interesting about Kathy O'Brien's book is it's like a tell-all. And th it is littered with mm -hmm. people that are part of this network. Yep. It, one of the people that she talks about is Patrick Leahy. So I'm going to read you. A, a, he's there. He's That's on right. the Senate Judiciary Committee. Yeah. Okay. So here we have a guy who is in her inner circle, or she's in his inner circle. And then he's there at the same time. Christina, during the headlights, Blasi Ford is there. So I'm going to read this. Uh, this is from uh, the, the Transformation of America. God condones that one, Leahy said, referring both to my role in NAFTA and his pedophile abuse of my daughter. Of course, God is not the one you need to be concerned with. He is a passive God, one who's passed on and lives only in a Bible. The God you need to be concerning yourself with is the all-seeing, all-knowing God, that great big eye in the sky mm -hmm. that sees all, records all, and transmits the information right where it's needed. Let me give you some vet sound advice. Keep your mouth shut. And none of this need to be known anywhere. Only your vice president, Bush, in parentheses, will know for sure. And he's been keeping secrets all his life. I'm not suggesting George Bush is God. Oh, no. He is much more than that. He is a semi-God, which means he is straddling the heavenly and earthly planes in order that he take action on what he sees with his ever watchful eye in the sky. Content with his metaphorical manipulation of my literal mind, he finished, now that's enough foreplay. Go get the kid. That wow. comes from Kathy O'Brien, okay? Yep. That's how that, that is how this works, kids. Yep. So let me, let's go one step further here. This is the next paragraph. My most traumatic encounters with Leahy were alien-themed. Mm -hmm. But he often relied on my Catholic upbringing to drive his points into my mind. From my perspective, Leahy was unquestionably one of the most intelligent criminals in the entire shadow government. His carefully contrived chameleon-like characteristics provided him the latitude of appearing to share the principles and beliefs of whomever he was masterfully manipulating mm. on both a national and international level. He won Reagan's respect through their shared diplomatic ties to the Vatican and his Irish Catholic heritage. While he appeared publicly to oppose Byrd on Senate appropriations issues, they actually worked together behind the scenes and their shared world dominance efforts. These people do this all the time. What you saw on stage was mostly theater. Mostly theater. There might have been a few moments mm -hmm. like when Cory when Corey Booker got up there and had his monologue. That was not theater. Yeah. That was him running for president. All right. Um, him and Kamala so, Harris. Him, him, him and Kamala Harris have used all of this as their advertisement campaigns. Oh, for absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And they're both the, two, they're two of the biggest twits I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, anyway, she goes on to say, again, from my perspective, Leahy was a loner who had his own agenda and answered to no one I knew. Leahy's intelligence was often manifested to me by the triple depth meaning of his words and actions. Everything he did was for a deeper purpose. So this is the guy. He's sitting right there. He just, the she just Senate said Judicial triple, meeting. triple death. Triple depth meaning. Like now, for some reason, that makes me think of the door. Okay. Be the door that we just saw. Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's at least a triple depth meaning in that door. Yeah. Absolutely. We should just all stare at that door for about 10 minutes and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. So okay. anyway, I, want, I wanted to throw that in there because of the subject matter and what we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Kat, yeah. Kat, her book is incredible. I mean, there's you that can go, guys, go look at that. Go look at uh, Fritz Springmeier and Cisco Wheeler's books. Look at Elisa E's books if you want to understand all of this stuff. But this is how it works. Okay, so where are we on, so, uh, you know, we brought that up in the first show we did about this, and I was, you know, I, I, at that time, I was a little more convinced, I think, than you, that we were looking at some sort of, you know, MKUltra triggering of her, but watching her act like an eight-year-old like that was just, 
I mean, I was embarrassed to listening to her, to her. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously, like, I understand what's going on there, but it was uncomfortable to listen to. She sounded like a child. She sounded confused. She sounded like she didn't really know what was going on. I just couldn't, like, it's hard for me to take any of this stuff at all seriously, right? And then you have all of these other, like, weird allegations coming out, right, that, that are, like, you know, like the whole gang rape thing. Well, to me, that's, like, the other side of the possibilities with MK Ultra, right? Like, if, if Brett Kavanaugh also is, is an MK, right, then be- those, that's the kind of stuff that can happen under Ultra that his core would not know anything about, like his center personality would not know anything about. I don't, you know, what the way that they're reporting all that stuff sounds ridiculous, right? But I don't doubt that both of these people have been involved in, you know, sexual activities that were designed to uh, trigger, traumatize, but also manipulate and control them, right, to blackmail them. So we're looking at two sides of the same coin. I think they're, you know, they're both under control of a certain type. Maybe, you know, I don't know what level. She's clearly, she's clearly under control. She's I clear, believe, yeah. She's clearly under control. He doesn't, he, now, I, while I do believe that he and his side on a certain level are in on it, he doesn't appear to be under the level of control that she is like presently, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't exist in his past. And I do think that, you know, you shared an article with me by uh, Yoichi Shimatsu, right? That's how you say his last name. Yeah. Um, and talking about some of this, and I do agree that like a lot of this stuff that's been going on has been, you know, ways to kind of scare and threaten people who have been involved in sort of, you know, mm, not kosher, homosexual, pedophilia, and sexual activities and black, you know, scare them because they're blackmailed that way. And, you know, Kavanaugh could be amongst those or, or, no, not, or not, knowingly or not. But what we're looking at here, there's nothing, there's nothing, almost nothing other than some, you know, small strains of behavior and a few emotions, in my opinion, that are organic. All of this is theater of the absurd. It is theater of the absurd and it's absurd with consequences. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you, you know, it's okay. And look, I, I share a very strong belief with you about decentralization and moving away from th- this massive system that, you know, based on the Federal Reserve and the military industrial complex, the central banks, it really is a series of chains around us in a lot of ways. And I'm, I'm all for that. And at the same time, we're in that system. Right. Still. Right? Again, yeah. Yeah. So I think I have to pay a little homage to this, this what we're seeing here, which is unlike anything I've ever seen before. And, and I think it's supposed to be. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And, and this is way crazier than anything I've ever seen from the government before. Way crazier. Yeah. So we're, this is full tilt boogie. And you know yeah. when, when they're on full tilt boogie that they're they're going for it that you know the the idea here is ultimately to crash the system right you know and trump is playing his role in crashing the system Mm -hmm. whether it's an active role or um a byproduct of his astrological chart him being an agent of chaos right so this is what's going on it's an attempt to crash the system just like um at the end of uh, fight club right yes the system, system collapses yeah. So, so there, so I think there's a lot of this going on mm-hmm. and, um, oh, by the way, I don't know if you saw, uh, Steve Bannon's interview with uh, Bill Maher. The other I, night. I did watch a little bit of it. Yeah. Bannon had some interesting things to say. I mean, he said that if, that if, uh, the Democrats get in that Trump will be impeached. I mean, he was unequivocal. Yeah, he said that. I heard that. Yeah. It was unequivocal. And, and there was like a, people didn't know what to think. There was kind of a round of applause. They're like, what? He's saying this, you know, I mean, Ben is an interesting character. I mean, he's a populist. Yep. And I don't think he's tied to anybody. Like he's like, you know, nope. cozying up to Michael Avenetti now, which. No, uh, Bannon Bannon. is only interested in Bannon. Well, it's Bannon plus this idea of the populist movement. Like he's really tied into right. working class people and roots. And but it's thinks- not actually because he cares about them. It's because this is something he sees that he can sort of, that he can, you know, like he's a narcissist in the same vein that Donald Trump is. Right. And so this is something that he can do or manipulate or control and then be, oh, look, see how wonderful he is. Well, the difference between Bannon and Trump is um, the, the difference in their astrological signs. Ah. Trump is a Gemini, so he's going to be clever. You know, he thinks he's smarter than everybody else on, on kind of a day-to-day level. 
Um, but he's not really into big ideas. Trump is not a big, big idea person. Mm -hmm. Bannon, however, is. Bannon is a Sagittarius. Mm -hmm. So he's guided by an overall philosophy. And his overall philosophy doesn't necessarily have to do with the same kind of brand of maybe Leo rising narcissism that Donald Trump has. You know, his brand of philosophy tends to be about being, quote, unquote, down with the people and the mm -hmm. working class yeah. and, and the people that got left behind because he comes from a working class family and he had, a, he had a crappy experience in the military, even though he did pretty well. He saw what happened in the military where elites rose to a position of prominence and basically were you know, very fallible leaders. So he goes to New York and makes a ton of money on Wall Street with Goldman Sachs. And, and then makes a ton of money with Larry David and Seinfeld. So he's an interesting character, and, but he is guided by this, this philosophy that somehow that a populist, nationalist, sort of Sagittarian kind of movement will prevail. And, yeah. and that, I think, he differs from Trump. And I actually believe that he believes in that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's some aggrandizement of his... Of his um, but do you yeah, think okay. it's actually because he cares about the people or because he just believes that this is what will work and, that, and so he wants to attach himself to something that will work? I th uh, well, if he wanted to attach himself to something that would work, he'd be a globalist. And he's okay. not. Yeah. And when I say something that will work, I mean, that's where the prevailing trends are theoretically headed, right? Get right. rid of the borders. You know, who wants to be part of a you know, kind of ugly, regressive, nationalist state? So he's picking a cause that is unpopular. Yeah. Um, but I, I believe popular and unpopular. I got, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I believe that 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 is his guiding philosophical principle. Mm -hmm. And there, there are Democrats who are actually shocked at times by his willingness to kind of reach out because he remembers the way the Democratic Party used to be. Used to be right. He probably and so, used to be a Democrat. Oh, I more than likely. Yeah. You know, but when when the Democrats abandoned the working class and move their countries over companies overseas or companies got moved overseas and they were complicit with the unions and stuff like that. I think he saw the writing on the wall and was like, hold on. There, there are these groups of people that need to be represented. They're underrepresented. And maybe just, maybe I can rally them. Right. So I think that's where we didn't, I wasn't planning on going there, but I, but I think that's yeah. the advantage. And he's a very bright guy. He's very bright. There's no doubt about that. He's yeah. super bright. And he, by the way, he's looking better. You can tell he stopped drinking. Yeah, he's not, his face isn't so red anymore. He doesn't have the gin blossoms blooming on his face. <laughs> so getting back to what we were talking about, which is kind of where we are now, the whole thing with the FBI and the investigation, that was a done deal. That was going to happen. You know, this, this, this was all theater with Flake and Coons and all that stuff. So now the, the, the latest allegations are that he was a hard party or that he drank a lot in college. Mm -hmm. So – do you want to talk a little bit more about the Shimatsu thing? Because yeah, I, I, I got some points I want to attach to that. So why don't you go ahead and drop into the Shimatsu piece? Okay, real quickly, though, before mm, – well, maybe we'll come back to this after. Well, we'll drop into the Shimatsu. I want to make sure we, we hit this. Okay, so you sent me this uh, article by Yuichi Shimatsu, and um, – I always pull something different from his articles and probably what he's intending. But there's one segment of the article that says a BlackRock connection, right? And so, and actually now come, I just had another thought about this. So the CIA link investment fund, BlackRock created by, you know, is, 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 is part of this, right? The Christine Blassie Ford's dad is connected to that, right? Well, what else is BlackRock? BlackRock is the desert in Nevada where a burning man is, right? And so, which is also CIA linked, also Stanford Research Institute linked, but this fund has had a prime investor, been a prime investor also in SunTrust Bank, which makes me think solar cult, Burning Man. But this is also about burning men, right? This is about now having new witch trials in which men are burnt at the stakes, right? That's um, right. But so if you look into this, so I'm just going to read this paragraph. The CIA link investment fund, BlackRock, created by former Commerce Secretary Peter Peterson, is a, which is an interesting name, yeah, right? Exactly. Peter Peterson is a major shareholder behind Corcept Therapeutics, interesting, and has also been the prime investor in SunTrust Bank, the successor to National Savings and Trust, where Christine, Christine's father, Richard G. Blasey Jr., served as a vice president in charge of financing the agency's undercover operations, 
Burning Man. Among his many financial beneficiaries was psychiatry professor Frederick Melgus, who was in charge of establishing MKUltra at the Stanford Medical School. Melgus's area of research was a depersonalization and reinvention of personality, introducing a focus on a new future. In short, transformation. Burning Man, right? Everybody who goes to Burning Man has, you know, like they just they have this transformation where they come back and they're a new person and they're reinvented. The funny thing is, is they're all reinvented as the same person, and at least in what I've been able to sort of see, right? So in short, a transformation as in how a directionless David Webb became an objective targeted Jason Bourne. So here we are completely dealing with, you know, MK Ultra stuff, right? And I just lost the thought that I had about something a second ago. But we're talking about BlackRock Fund. We're talking about BlackRock Desert. All of this kind of stuff. You've talked about Burning Man, Wicker Man, the burning of men, right? And That's right. This yep. is like a modern day reenactment of the Salem witch trials, but with men right? And mm -hmm. I, if I understand this correctly, I, I've not gotten a chance to watch it, but I really think I should. Jan Irvin did a bunch of, you know, there are problems with Jan Irvin, I know. But um, he had a series on the Salem Witch Trials and how they sort of connected to certain MK Ultra and stuff like that, right? So mm -hmm. what are we, I mean, we, what are we looking at here? What is this? What is going on? Well, I mean, I think it's happening in a multitude of, of levels. Right. Clearly, Christine Blasey Ford is an inside girl. I know what I was just inside thinking. Woman. Go ahead. Burning Man just happened right before all this stuff broke loose. So was Burning Man, did they perform the ritual that would then set this thing loose? Burning Man was just at the end of August. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then yeah. all of this has happened since then, right? And the Burning Man theme, I think, this year was iRobot. I haven't heard too much about what went on there this year because I just have been completely out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it occurred, literally, I bet you if we went and tracked – when Burning Man occurred and when all this Kavanaugh nonsense started, I bet you there'd be a pretty tight connection. Um, yeah. So Burning Man happens in the first week of September. Last week of August, first week of September, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I think that's when she might have been in contact with Feinstein. Yeah. With the letter. Right. Okay. Um, so, yeah. I, I mean, I think that the – the Orphic rites or the, the sacrifice of uh, the wicker man, Anthony Bourdain, which mm -hmm. gets into hashtag me too. Mm -hmm. And there's like just a few degrees of separation between Alyssa Milano, who was right on mm -hmm. uh, Brett Kavanaugh's right shoulder the whole time. Right. And the connection between her and Shannon Doherty and Rose McGowan who play witches Mm -hmm. on the, uh, the old TV series Charmed. Right. So here we have this witch theme, Alyssa Milano, Rose McGowan, Rose McGowan, Asia Argento, Anthony Bourdain, who I believe is really the wicker man for the hashtag Me Too movement. The he is one version of the sacrifice. Right. And then there's Burning Man, which is like a full celebration of it, right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah full celebration under the Black Rock, and solar, solar cult, it's Black a, it's Sun. On, it's on Black Rock Desert. Yep. That's where it takes place, Black Rock Desert. And you and I were talking about that Black Rock is really a reference mm -hmm. to, the, to the black Saturn hypercube. Mm -hmm. right? And the most famous depiction of that is in, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, right? Yep. The Kaaba. Yeah. And it's inside, also in the desert. It's in the desert. And theoretically, that's where the... Uh, the uh, Chintamani stone is. Right? This is a, a piece of a supposedly a, a magical piece from I think it came from what Sirius or someplace like that. Yeah, that's what the that's what the the story goes. Anyway, and so what we have here is we have that that's black rock. It is the black sun, and Saturn is the black sun. Mm -hmm. Saturn theoretically was right. the sun and we of still, our solar system. We're still living through the after effects of Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington and the black hole sun ritual the and. Sun. Yeah. <laughs> right. And the other thing that's really interesting that's come out around uh, Brett Kavanaugh is that USA Today started to suggest that he was a pedophile. Right. I mean, we're. Uh, Pizza did, Gate's not real and John Podesta's not a pedophile, but Brett Kavanaugh is. When, when was it acceptable mm -hmm. for a national publication to accuse somebody of being a pedophile without 
any evidence whatsoever. Well, oh, but it's okay. But it's okay if they do it. Everything we've been looking at in this case is people doing stuff without any evidence. It's covered. Right. And this is the whole, so this is the new way they're going to do everything. And this is what you and I, you and I were having a conversation the other night. That, and you talked about some of this on your flame this morning about the Dionysus and Apollo and all this kind of stuff, right? And so the, I see this as like this whole stuff with the FBI and all these accusations, like prove yourself, you're guilty until proven innocent. You have to prove your innocence. There, and how Me Too is connected to this is like a way of trying to, uh, sell people on this idea, sell it as radical transparency, right? If you haven't done anything wrong, you should be perfectly happy with letting everybody see all your business and being investigated by everything and all that kind of stuff, right? So they're going to dress it up as radical transparency. As This is just like, you know, you know this is not um, unconstitutional or criminal or wrong or invasive of one's privacy or any of that kind of stuff. This is the new era of radical transparency where if you have nothing to hide, you will beg for the FBI to investigate you. Absolutely. That's a really important point. Oh, come on. If you've got nothing to hide, just, you know, this guy's, sure. What is there even to investigate? Go. She doesn't even know where right, it you could do it. You could do it right now. Oh, doesn't it feel good? Just turn, <laughs> just turn to your left and request that an FBI investigation. But what are they even going to investigate? <clears throat> well, they're going to bring more people into this. Right. But they don't know where, they don't know when. The, the people that, that she claims who have all sort, so, you know, at this point. Well, said, uh, well Sweat, Sweat Nikki is completely and, and utterly uh, corrupt Sweet. as a witness. <laughs> What a name, huh? Sweat Nikki. Isn't it Sweatnik? Sweatnik. Sorry. I thought Sweatnik. you were. Oh, I thought you were calling her Sweat Nikki to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> it is Sweatnik. Still, Sweatnik. Right. Sounded, anyway, these that's, all that's, sound like code names. All these names don't sound real to me. Mark Judge, my, Blazy Ford, Sweatnik, Kevin Nonsense, Frankenstein. What you know? Come on. Well, she's Blake, she's Coons. she's my, Michael Alvinetti's latest uh, latest client, right? right? He's running for president too, right? He will at some point. That yeah. guy's serious. He's, a, he's, he's an Aquarius. So born February 13th. It'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Anyway, uh, by the way, by the way, Brett Kavanaugh born February 12th. So they're born one day apart, ah. different years. Mm -hmm. uh, Kavanaugh was born in 1965. And uh, Avenetti or Avenetti, he was born in 1971. So they're separated by about six years. Anyway. Um, yeah, so there's you know, there, there's there's some very you know wild themes going on here, and I think they're going to focus on this Ramirez woman, but you know they've got a week to figure something out, uh, and I don't know what's going to happen at the end of the week. I think it's going to be, I think they'll find somebody somewhere to foul up something and <laughs> try to extend it. By the way, Comey was out there today, you know, who's become the the voice of America's conscience, James Comey, for for God's sake. And he's saying that no time limit should be put on this, uh, that they should have, you know, an extended amount of time. You know, and the other thing, too, about the FBI, which I talked about on my show, and we might have talked about it before, but if we, if we haven't covered this, Christine Blassie's, um, Christine Blassie's brother employs Peter Strzok's sister-in-law. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, so Peter How Strzok's, what would you say? The ha the, like, this web is crazy. And I, did I ever tell you my realization about Struck? No. Okay. So one of the things that came along after the Me Too movement, which has been an interesting thing, has was the walk away movement, right? The hashtag yes. walk away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And which lasted it, all of like, five minutes. But it's still going. It, it's still sort of going on a little bit in the background, like there's right. And it's about this is about making sure that people who are disgusted with one party or the other, they don't leave the system altogether, they just switch to the other party, right? Yes. So you're not going to be a Democrat anymore. You become a Republican, stay in the pen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The guy who started that campaign, his name is Brandon Strzok, but also spelled not, like when you look at Peter Strzok, it looks like Strzok or Strzok, right? Right, right. right? Spelled S-T-R-O-Z-C-K or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. This Brandon Strzok guy is spelled S-T-R-A-K-A. -A. So 
people who watch our show know I have this theory about some of the stuff with simulations that it's coded for something to happen related to some word, right? So mm -hmm. we have the Peter Strzok thing. We have the Brandon Strzok thing, right? Like how, how are we getting two of these Strzoks that aren't spelled like Strzok, right? Coming up right at one after another, like we had um, Hurricane Harvey, the shooting at the Harvest Festival, and then the Harvey, Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein right. right? What is this? Yeah, it's so weird. I don't know if it means anything, but I, you know, I catch all these little things. So yeah, ab absolutely. And and then if it, Peter Strzok, so Blazy Ford is connected to Peter Strzok. Yes, yes. So yeah, so her brother employs Peter Strzok's sister-in-law. So the woman that's married to Peter Strzok's brother. And we're not talking about Peter Strzok anymore. You no, know, but we are talking about the FBI and like, oh well, let's anoint the FBI. Right. Let's, let's make the FBI this. Well, it's re elevating them because they had a bad fall with, with Peter Absolutely. Strzok and James Comey. Absolutely. And right, right now, like nobody's talking about the fact that Rod Rosenstein is being looked at to be fired and whatever, right? Nobody's talking about any of that stuff anymore. You know, mm -hmm. nobody's talking about the Mueller investigation. So this is like a like tear down and, re and rehabilitation in one fell swoop of like covering up the rush, this fact that there is no Russian collusion and all this cry. I mean, this is just get getting people who are starting to lose faith in the FBI to worship the FBI again. Right. They're going to come in and they're going to be the moral authority and say, you know, we have rendered a judgment and that judgment is. But do, I right. mean, this, this, this isn't even the FBI's jurisdiction, is it? Uh, well, according to Kavanaugh, what they can do is they can provide pieces of information. I think he calls them 302s or something like that. Right. But they cannot render a judgment. That judgment needs to be rendered inside of that Judiciary Committee or on the Senate floor, which is probably what will happen, that they'll introduce these articles that the FBI will bring up. So likely... And the FBI, by the way, knows everything about this guy anyway. Okay. And they know everything they need to know about Christine Blasey Ford anyway. They don't need to sit down right. and talk with her. They've got files this thick on the two of them already. Right. So this is all just a big dog like and pony if, show. Whatever. If this thing with her is real, is it, wouldn't this have, wouldn't, this was not an FBI matter. This would be like, why hasn't anyone called the, the, the local police? If this is really a thing, right? Well, because I think it happened theoretically so long ago. Now, in the state of Maryland, where it, it supposedly happened, um, there is no such thing as a statute of limitations. Right. So theoretically, Brett Kavanaugh could be charged for something. Like, that would be the ultimate kind of weird endgame. You know, having Brett Kavanaugh being walked out in, in handcuffs. I don't think that might hap not happen either. Yeah, I like, just got like I just got a shoot down in my legs. Like maybe that. Like yeah. Like what is? I mean, I just got when I get body sensations and stuff like that. Those are hits. Like yeah. I mean, this. I think this might get really crazy. It could get but extremely I, crazy. But I also now, think if it gets super crazy. Like my gut just says he's in on it, dude. I don't know if he's completely in on it. I don't. I don't feel that. I like he was way, in on it in the beginning, and it's gone somewhere that he didn't expect. The way that he. A lot, the way that he presented himself emotionally. Right. He wanted to fucking kill somebody. Right. And well, if, you, if you, you thought you were doing one thing and then they, you, if you thought you were playing one role and then they flipped it on you in the middle, you'd be super pissed, right? Well, possibly. But even the, the, the terms and conditions, which was tarring and fe his feathering his family and dragging them through the mud, probably got him super pissed too. I mean, I think... I don't think the man is a complete and utter sociopath. Um, but then again, I don't really know him. He does, you know, I mean, he's got weird connections, mm -hmm. especially with his wife and the Bush family. Mm -hmm. I mean, his wife has worked for the Bush family since they were here in Texas. Yep. And um, she was a personal assistant to George W. Bush and was part of that Bush Cheney campaign. You want to talk Kathy O'Brien? Hello. Right. I and mean, I was going to say, is it just all, all of these connections that you're able, like, to me, this is just like, if we get nothing else from this, this is all of the evidence that this needs to be dissolved, right? This it certainly needs, needs to be down. Needs to be well. If we take it down, then we better have something better in right. place. And quite frankly, we don't. Right. So I'm all for doing something different. Yeah. But I'm not going to take it down and hand it over to the military. No. 
and I'm not going to take it down and hand it over to the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the left. The UN or the left. Or or the, I, I'm just not ready to surrender no, whatever this is. But I, but to, me, what the, to me, what I say when I mean dissolve or take it down, I don't necessarily mean a formal process. What I mean is like, this is when people need to stop their belief in the authority of government, right? Because that's that part of, I totally agree with. Yes. That's part of why the government is able to get away with it because the people believe in its authority. If the people right. stop paying so much attention to it, right? If people just stop, like, like part of it is just even like how much attention is being paid to this nonsense, right? They have everybody's mind captured. And so if people stop, I mean, you know, if people stop, people get mad at me because I don't vote, right? But part of the reason that I don't vote, it's like writing letters to Santa Claus when you don't believe in it, right? You know, if people stop voting, then at a certain point, you know, it's, you know. They would make it up. If people stop voting, they would make it up. <laughs> they would. They could, you could ask a person, do you vote no? Do you vote no? Do you vote no? You know, they'd have a, and they'd have a record turnout. <laughs> you might be right about that. But yeah, I, I, think that, I think that they'd figure that one out. I think what people have to stop doing is they, they've got to take at least three weeks and stop doing anything. That's, well, that's, that's always been my thing. Like even like, the idea of if everybody just stayed in their house, didn't go out, didn't spend money, didn't do any of that kind of stuff for a week, two weeks, three weeks, the system would fall because the system only runs on the energy of the fact that people believe in it. Believe in it. You get 30% of the population just shutting it down for three yep. weeks. I'll, I'm in. And they, they, would, they would come knocking, begging, please come back. Yeah. Please come back. It's like when you were yeah. on Facebook for a week. Hey, did you see so and so posted? Right. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I mean <laughs> we're, we're, there was something that, uh, there was there was a place I was going with this. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm no, it's it's okay. I mean, all right. So one of the things that we're seeing here from an astrological perspective, I want to bring a little astrology in. Yeah, yes, please. Um, is that right now we're in this really new and initiatory phase of Chiron and Aries. And Aries represents male energy, right? It's masculine. It's ruled by Mars. Venus, on the other hand, is ruled by Venus, even though it is technically, well, it, it is technically, um, uh, well, on the one side, Venus in Taurus is feminine. Venus in Libra is actually, it's still feminine, but it's air, it's masculine. But just for the sake of, you know, sort of gender dispensation, right? <laughs> Aries, exactly. male. Aries male, Venus female. So we have Aries, Chiron, which is known as the wounded healer. And Chiron here, I'm going to bring Chiron into this too. Okay. Chiron is the wounded healer, right? And uh, Chiron, is a, he's, a, he's a centaur. And as he was the daughter of Philyra and Cronus. And he's part, he's eternal because his father was Cronus. He's a god. Came down to earth, appeared as a white stallion, mated with a nymph from the ocean. Boom, you get, you get a centaur. You get the most mm -hmm. uh, brilliant, intelligent, cultured centaur. The centaurs were yahoos. Mm -hmm. right? they, were, they were all, you know, half horse, half human. They couldn't figure out, you know, how to do a lot of stuff, right? But, but Chiron was very gifted. He was schooled by both Apollo and Artemis. So mm -hmm. he knew what was going on, okay? So um, uh, Chiron also represents our wound mm -hmm. in astrology. Because what happens with, with Chiron is once his mother, Philyra, sees him, she rejects him completely out of shame. So Chiron has to deal with shame. Hmm. It has to deal with shame. And so when we have Chiron in our charts, what we do is we work over the course of our lifetime to heal this kind of original sin in our lives, which is shame. And it's in different signs for different people. Okay, so we're in Chiron and Aries now. It's at the first degree. It's, so it's very fresh. We just went into this. We went to Chiron and Aries back in March, late March. And when that happened, it signaled the, the sort of this collective theater of the wounded male. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what did we see not long after that? The death of Anthony Bourdain. Mm -hmm. So we see Bourdain's death, the wounded male. Yep. Now we're seeing Brett Kavanaugh. Right, the wounded male, all and all, all of these people been, who seems to have been a who seems to have had a fairly good life, and so his wound is now, right? To some extent, I think so. 
Yeah. I think so. But when we get into the, you know, into this collective theater, people sometimes become symbols. Yeah. Right? So he's the, not, uh, not uh, even yeah. who they are anymore. Yeah. Right. So now he becomes this target of this, of the flawed and wounded male. Now, one of the things that I talked about today on my show, and you, t- you and I talked about yesterday, was this notion of Dionysus. Right. And Dionysus being the god of what? Alcohol. And mm-hmm. what, what, what is Brett Kavanaugh under the microscope of? Drunk. Alcohol. Yep. Drunkenness. He bo- likes beer. Bo- he bo- likes beer. Daily. I like beer. I like yeah. beer. Right. So this is what's under the microscope. And by the way, we are in the season right now of Bacchus and Dionysus. This is the time of the harvest. Okay. So we are in Dionysus season. Right. And what happens with Dionysus? Dionysus is torn asunder by the Furies because of, you know, his betrayal to, to the Furies, right? He's torn apart. And this is what we were, we were initiated into the cult of Dionysus in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. That's what part of MK Ultra was about. Totally. Okay. And totally. we had, and we had the lizard King. Sex, was, drugs, right. music, alcohol, decadence. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, like mind blowing experiences, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And Brett Kavanaugh was born right in the middle of the 1960s, 1965, which is the year of the snake or the year of the serpent. Mm-hmm. Right. So he is now this Dionysic figure. And I couldn't even think of a less Dionysic figure, by the way, than Brett Kavanaugh. The guy is white and uptight. You know, <laughs> if you wanted to sacrifice a Dionysic figure, you, I don't know, maybe Bourdain. Bourdain was definitely Dionysian. Yeah. Right, he, he loved his food, food drink, drink, all that. Totally wine. decadent. Totally. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So he, so on the, he's probably like one version of this sacrifice, and then Brett Kavanaugh, and they're trying to make him this Dionysian figure by all this alcohol that he's consumed. So yeah. let's say, for instance, the Me Too movement, hashtag Me Too, are the Furies, right? Ripping these Dionysian figures apart limb from limb and Brett Kavanaugh is symbolic of that. Okay. So what happens kind of in the, in the, the, the reactive uh, mode of the reality of that is that we have a rise of the Apollonian. Apollo, Apollo, right. Exactly. Now light, the light, the structure exactly. and form. Right. So, okay. Who's really popular right now? Jordan Peterson. Jordan P- oh, yeah, yeah. That's good. Right? Jordan they- Peterson is the furthest thing from Dionysian yep. as you can get. Yeah. Then you got your pals over on the dark web side. Right. In right? an intellectual dark web. Right. They're kind of Apollonian, right? Ben Shapiro, all those people, all about structure and form. Right. What about Joe Rogan? Joe Rogan sure went from sure. lunacy, conspiracy theory, yep. right, into being what? Apollonian. Yeah, structure. Let's and form. Pr- let's prove it. Let's prove it. Science, pseudoscience, well, whatever. Also, right. Even just look at his body. His body's about structure and form. His body is Apollonian. Yep. Okay. So we are in the throes of this culture change. Where does okay? Just that. Just curious, because it's just popping into my head. We, Jordan Peterson is also into this um, carnivore diet, right? So all he eats is meat, salt, and water. Right. Right. Talk about structure and form. Yeah. Right. Talk about like, I mean, that's like the complete opposite. You know, some people think meat is murder or whatever meat is decadent, but like this is a guy who does meat, salt and water, right? There's no decadence to that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. He claims that if he eats any, eats anything other than that or drinks anything other than that, he becomes ill. Right. So it's so interesting. Like he really is representing structure and form in, in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, his first chapter of his book is stand up straight with your shoulders back. Second chapter right. is clean your room. That's right. That's Apollo. Yeah. yeah. That's Apollo. So we're moving now. This to me, hashtag me too, now moves into the realm of the archetypal. Yep. And while it is not a bad thing to be Apollonian, and I think it's part of a, a long kind of overdue phase and cycle, the extended adolescence. <laughs> I just thought of something else too. From, from the 60s to the mid 2000s. What did you think of? Joe Rogan didn't, he used to believe the moon land, the Apollo moon missions were fake and now he believes they're real. There you go. Ha! How about that? There you go. 
the Dionysian to the Apollonian, you know, yep. okay, the clear light of reason. Yep. So wow. one of the things that's um, interesting about this also, right, is that there's now this shift away from, and, and Rogan's kind of, kind of uh, symbolic of the emblematic of it, the moving away from conspiracy theory. Right. And into, okay, the cold light of reason, got to prove it. But there's, but there's, it's not just, well, you know, throw your ideas out into the marketplace and let's see if they stack. It's, it's more of, of, of a, uh, a frontal assault on them in some ways. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and I think even like the difference between Obama and Trump represents Obama is Dionysian, right? That's what he represents. He represents a lot of things, but mostly this figure that emerges from the imagination. Um, there was delirium. Like, you know, when you saw Trump, there wasn't delirium, but like there was delirium at the Obama events. Mm -hmm. Like there were women wetting their pants <laughs> at the Obama events. Okay. Oh, people That's were crying like they do at Michael Jackson. They would do at Michael Jackson concerts and fainting and stuff like that. Remember the women? Yeah, they were doing that. I mean, so it was delirious. So it was like Dian he was Dionysian. Remember, they, remember they would show that, like, they had been actually triggering those fainting women in the audience. Remember those videos that showed that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's del that's delirium. Yeah. So that's what he represented, and, and and he's like the end of of that cycle now. And and Trump, who's a Leo rising, mm -hmm. which is the sun. Right, you go up to the top of Trump Tower. It is the Temple of Apollo. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this has to do with the fact that that there is this this Apollonian consciousness that is now beginning to assert itself. And hashtag Me Too is in their own way facilitating it, even though they think they're tearing it down. Right, they are not. They are not. Right. They are not. They're, they're actually ushering, they're ushering in the police state. The police complete police surveillance. Prove yourself innocent under the name of radical transparency. That's right. Yeah. That's that's definitely the, part of it. Yeah. Of it. But it will also be these ideas and attitudes and beliefs that will shape young men moving forward, and it will happen. And thirty-five to forty years from thirty years from now, we're in another generation when these young Pluto and Capricorn kids, a lot of them begin to grow up. We're going to see very different types of, of men during that time. And, you know, Capricorn means business. And we're going to have a whole generation of kids that mean business, man. And I mean business. When some of these Pluto and Capricorn kids hit 16, 17, 18, some of them are going to be CEOs of companies. Yep. I, I, I kid you not. Well, so they're not going to have sex anymore because they're going to be afraid. So they're going to focus on something else. That, well, that's, that's part of it. Capricorn is about ascent. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, so we're moving. This is what hashtag me too is. They, the, it is the manifestation of the Furies mm -hmm. who are literally ripping the Dionysic culture to shreds. And as far as another astrological sort of piece here, which I thought was really interesting, is that speaking of Dionysus and Lunar, both Blassie Ford and Kavanaugh have really vulnerable south nodes in terms of like the, the, the south node of the moon, right, in their charts, that they have very vulnerable points. For Kavanaugh, it has to do with the law. His south node is in Sagittarius. And for Blassie Ford, it is Scorpio and sexuality hmm. and, and sort of you know, this kind of dark world. So they're both operating from a field of vulnerability and weakness in the public eye. Mm -hmm. This is not a great display for either of them. Yeah. So wow. this is, yeah, very, very interesting stuff. And we're going to go into Venus what? retrograde in Scorpio and God knows what they're going to find out with the Venus Scorpio retrograde. Move. One more thing I want to say that I think is interesting about Kavanaugh is one of the things that, you know, I mean, I, I'm not into any of these guys, you know me, I'm like, mm, get rid of all of them. He's not great on the fourth amendment, right? He's he, like, he, like he's, you know, he thinks, it's okay to surveil people and all that kind of stuff. He also thinks the indefinite detention part of the NDAA is okay and stuff like that. You know, people should talk about that instead of this stuff. But he hasn't been great on privacy, and now his privacy is being invaded. South Node and Sagittarius. Yeah. You know, Sagittarius is one of those signs where do as I say, not as I do. Yep. 
So in some ways, even though this is completely abhorrent, not appropriate in any way, it is interesting that, you know, a little bit reap what he sowed here. A little bit, a little yeah. bit. I, I'd agree with that. I mean, um, this is a guy that theoretically helped cover up the Vince Foster affair. Yeah, I, I keep hearing you talk, say he's connected to Vince Foster, but I think I missed where you may have gone into that and explained that more clearly. I wasn't aware of that. The Vince Foster thing has got so many threads to it, but. Yeah, it does have a lot of threads to it. I'll have to, to hear what you said, what you said about that, because I keep, keep hearing you mention that. Uh, and also, apparently, and I haven't tracked this down, but um, apparently he, he, he's connected to the Patriot Act as well, that he might have been somebody who advised on the Patriot Act. Or sure. Was consulted. I mean, it's, that's probably, you know, I, Well, I if, he, if he likes the NDAA and he doesn't believe in privacy, then that is, I mean, the NDAA is the next obvious extension of the Patriot Act, right? No, abs absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, but the, the pro, I mean, if you're going to get into this process and you're going to frag somebody, um, go after those things. Right. Because those things are meaningful. Yeah. Like They're that's, worthwhile. That, and that's something that, like, right and left could have, the, the people on the right, or at least the honest ones, may have been like, oh, you know what, you know, at least all these libertarians and constitutionalists and people who are afraid of the things Obama did, if you brought this stuff up about, about Kavanaugh, that, that might have been something you could have gotten them to go along with you on, right? Like, yeah, but, but the Patriot Act is inviolate. It's like a sacred cow. But they love that shit. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, because surveillance and all that yeah. makes, makes people feel safe and secure, and they get lots of money and appropriation money, and they've flown around the world, and yeah. all kinds of junk hits, all these surveillance companies and they get to go to Israel and get blackmailed and <laughs> you know, it's great fun. It's right. Great fun. Believe yeah. In the Patriot Act. yeah. So, 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 I mean, that's really where I think that the, that the real injustice to the American people is taking place. Yeah. It's not, it's not the dog and pony show. The dog and pony show is interesting. Right. Uh, to some degree, but there's a lot, there, there are other things that are, that are much deeper that, um, and maybe not that much deeper. We won't have to dig too much to find them. That's what we should be talking about. Yeah. But we're not. We're not. It's so interesting, her connections to, like, the pharmaceutical industry as well, and the, uh, the morning after abortion pill and all this kind of stuff, and, um, and the way that that ties in. You know, we're talking about sexual assault, and then we're talking about morning after pill, and people are, you know, afraid that he might, uh, you know, do something with Roe versus Wade and make abortion more difficult. So it's so – there's just – so many levels to this. It's kind of unbelievable. So I just want to read a paragraph from the uh, Shimatsu piece. Yes, please. And this is about the, the abortion connection. Uh, Blasi Ford is now employed at Corsept Therapeutics. Right. What, is that word? what does Corsept mean? It sounds like forcept and or uh, uh, cortical cor your cortex frontal like, right. I mean, I'm going to look yeah. up what Corsept cortex means. Cortex and cor and uh, forcept. I'm anyway, Corsept, Corsept Therapeutics. A pharmaceutical company with a disturbing record of ethical violations, including insider trading with Stanford and Silicon Valley. Its most heavily promoted drugs include psychiatric agents and abortion pills. Her fast exit for embryos is a generic called Coralim, better known as Mif uh, Mifepristone or Mifepristone or RU486, as in RU486 in that little burden. First developed by Roussel in France and then cloned in China uh, to bail out a plethora of lawsuits mm. over side effects, including vaginal bleeding and uterine cramps. The French producer gave the proprietary right to the Population Council, a Rockefeller-funded NGO involved in legal genocide. An SEC investigation of Corsep's hidden ties with Stanford led to a steep fall in its stock market values since the start of 2018. To counter the share value tumble, the company has been attempting a sideways strategy of using Coralim as an anti-hyperglycemia drug and also as an antidepressant. This magic cure-all is the panacea that 86 is all your problems. All right. Now, is it any wonder that Christine Blasey Ford is being put in front of the Senate for a sneak promotion of her abortion pill, question mark. And there's one more. Chrissy's husband, Russell Ford, by strange coincidence, also works for pharmaceuticals as a mechanical engineer. Think of the big rolling machines that make pills and presses that close capsules, including Abbott, the RU486 in India, 
and Zanano Macroflex, which produces non-needle injection devices for vaccine campaigns, mm -hmm. like the health boosting campaign sponsored, uh, sponsored under the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Global Population Extermination Strategy. So she's got deep ties. Deep ties. Now listen to this. I just looked up Corsept. There yeah. is no definition for the word Corsept, mm -hmm. right? There's no definition. Uh, there's no etymology for that word either, right? So no definition, right. no etymology. And guess so. Corsept Therapeutics, Inc. is a pharmaceutical company engaged in the discovery, development, and commercialization of drugs for the treatment of severe metabolic, psychiatric, and oncologic disorders. Do you know where it is he headquartered? Uh, Washington, D.C. No. Where? M Menlo Park. Men oh, Menlo Park. Oh, Menlo, right? Oh, Menlo. Menlo. Yeah. Let's bring yeah. it down. <laughs> How it. about that? Menlo, Menlo Park. Park. This is about bringing down the men, right? Yeah. I mean, this <laughs> I can find one of those in everything. I'm sick, but like, you know what I mean? Like, but that's, I mean, I see that here. I'm just trying to see if there's, they have, they have, they have a code of ethics, of course, therapeutics. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that they make metabolic drugs too. Mm -hmm. Metabolic, psychiatric, and oncologic disorders. It's very interesting. I don't. Mm. I think SRI is located in Menlo Park. Yeah. You know, that whole area is, is um, that's the, like, like um, the uh, birth control pill was mm -hmm. basically created in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. but, th but in order to get around the science, they went to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that's where they created the, uh, the birth control pill. But it started <laughs> in the Bay Area. So, interesting. Hmm, they do tests on glucose intolerance too. Interesting. Right, which gets into the anti-glycemia right? piece yep. of Coralin. So mm -hmm. it's this whole the whole thing is kind of fascinating. Also, SRI, this ties back to just what I was saying about Burning Man earlier. SRI is also where a lot of this like um development of like MIDI and stuff with electronic music, right? And the and the correlation of that with mind control has gone on. And so of course then you have Burning Man with you know completely based on electronic music and you know, this the SRI is deep with all of this stuff. And of course, you know, there's all, all sorts of drugs being used at Burning Man, not just, you know, I, at this point, I'm sure they're experimenting with all sorts of, you know, weird off market designer pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. And it wouldn't be surprised me if some of this was being pr provided by companies like Corset. Could be. Tested we're, out. We're, we're, it, that, were, that story about the MIDI reminds me of this time when I was living in uh, California. Mm -hmm. and I, was in my, I was in my mid twenties. I was trying to find myself and if I find an appropriate kind of channel and you know, with stuff that I could do well with. And mm -hmm. I started to hang out with this really interesting woman who was a, a music teacher mm -hmm. and a keyboard player. And um, I was, I was her, she was a Capricorn too. I remember she was a Capricorn and I was her apprentice. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so one time I met her in a uh, pal in a, uh, whatchamacallit Mountain View, uh, Cupertino at, at Apple headquarters. Mm -hmm. And this was in mid eighties and she went in and she demonstrated MIDI mm -hmm. to the, to the people at Apple. Uh -huh. Right. So, you know, I thought, wow, this is, Really, really fascinating because I was I was kind of there on, on the front lines watching this whole MIDI thing go down. But the, the most interesting story with with her was that she had this band called Girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And and um, they were based out of Marin County. Mm -hmm. And and the guys that were putting this band together were this was this guy, Nardo Michael Walden and Walter Arseniev. And Walter Walter and Michael wrote huge hits for Aretha Franklin and uh, Whitney Houston and uh, Mariah Carey. I mean, they were a big, big hit making machine at that point in time. And it was really, it was really Walter. And um, so one night I'm, I'm at the studio in Mill Valley and I'm, it's all girls band with this uh, one guy, Vernon, uh, guitar player, super, super cool guy. Mm -hmm. so they're, they're, they're doing their thing and they're doing a little song and stuff like that. And Michael, who was a disciple of Sri Chinmoy, very powerful guy. I've never seen anything like this, right? He walks into the room and, and listens. And then he just starts like hitting them and doing this and doing this and doing this, right? 
and he's playing conductor in that moment. And he physically moved the energy in that room. Mm. And the band all of a sudden kicked into this whole other level. And mm. it was like, that was fucking impressive, dude. It was, yeah. That was really impressive. Maybe I should start meditating. You know, I mean, it was, <laughs> yeah. it was, so anyway, I just wanted to share that story because it's like one of these pieces of, of sort of Bay Area history. Yeah. And, Tarp and Tarpon Studios was pretty well known at that time. And then Walter and Michael split. Yeah. And Walter went to, went to Hollywood and kept writing big hits. And Michael sort of drifted off into, he was originally a big time jazz fusion drummer. Anyway, so, I just thought I'd share that story. No, but I like the way it ties in. Who is conducting this symphony? Who's, right. who, who's, who's doing this, yeah. right? That's, that, that's the big question. So it kind yes. of ties in there because everybody's being triggered to play their role. Right, just like he triggered the band to do their thing. Oh, right? it was amazing. It was, it was amazing. Who's the happened. conductor of this symphony? Mm -hmm. Right. That's, that's the, the conductor? question. Yeah. Who's behind the scenes? Yep. With Are the they wand. using MIDI control? <laughs> uh, could be. Could right? be they, five I mean, five G MIDI control, possibly. Sound right. Sound is is you know is triggering and whatever. Very interesting. Yeah. All right. Did you have anything you wanted to say about Serena Williams and Queen of Queens, or should we leave that? Well, just this whole thing around the Queen, you know, like the passing of Aretha Franklin, right? And um, this, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I did want to say this one thing. Okay, right. so we have the passing of Aretha Franklin, who's the, the Queen of Soul, and then right after that, Serena Williams becomes the Queen of Queens, right? Like, oh queen yeah. Okay. R-E-S-P. So, and all Serena was talking about was you don't have respect for me. R -E <laughs> right? Okay. Right. So keep that in mind. LeBron James is what? The king. The king. Okay. These people are not musicians. Right. They're athletes. Right. So we're moving from Dionysian culture, which is about music and decadence, to athletics, which is about structure and form. Apollonian <laughs> culture. There yep, it is. You got it. Yep. Wow. Yep. And yeah, that's it. I think you're right. I think you're right on about that. Yeah. Wow. All right, so, guys. So, the, so just, just in case you didn't get the memo, boys and girls, the party's over. Mm-hmm. All about structure, form, discipline, Whoop. regimen, all that stuff now. Whether you like it or not, the party's over. So here's, and here's what I would say. Embrace it in your own life or else it will be superimposed on yep. top of you. Yep. I mean, you're going to you're gonna have to find a way to private party in your own private way. But as far as the way you deal with the outer world structure, form, for sure, yeah. But I think it's important. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. look, we, we've had a really long, prolonged cultural, social, cultural adolescence. Long time. And I think, I think it's overdue. But in order for us to embrace it, right, we need to just embrace it ourselves. Yep. Yeah, you know, so a lot of these principles. Start exercising, start. Yes. Yep. A lot of these principles we're talking about, they're, they're, they're applicable to your life. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, there is something to be said for being the eh, authoritarian of your own life, right? Like, it's Instead of this, this, and I guess this is my message is people need to, you know, really check their belief in authority, right? This is the other thing about this. And this is where we have to be careful. There's the hashtag. I believe her. In fact, I was in Palm Springs to, you know, over the weekend and I was walking around this morning and there was a, um, an art gallery gift shop, right. That had, um, I don't know if you can see it, but we believe her. Right? Yeah, yeah, we yeah, believe her. yeah. So this is about belief, right? Because somehow belief being more important than knowledge or evidence, right? And so right. the belief and the way you counter this dark side of structure and form is to stop, you know, to really start checking out your belief, what authorities you believe in, right? Like you lose your belief in authority, become the authority in your own life and make the most of this Apollonian time. Yes, and I'm going to throw in one more little thing, which there's always a mind fuck. Always a mind fuck. There's always a mind fuck involved. A so while we're, moving, while we're moving towards this Apollonian kind of ingress, mm -hmm. 
I was noticing ads today on the internet for Ariana Grande's record, new record, which is Believe God me. is a Woman. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and it's really interesting because the ad that yeah. I saw, it was inverted and she was upside down. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah. While, while we're having, and I believe that the cultural tide is moving towards this Apollonian um, evolution. It's just happening. Yeah. And hashtag me too, performing the, the Dionysic uh, role of ripping apart the last shreds right. of the Dionysic culture. There is this um, kind of strong belief now that it's going to be the feminine that's going to take over. Right. But I don't believe that that's the case. Right. I, I don't. And when we, and this is part of the mind fog. Belief is the enemy of knowing. <laughs> right. This, right. This, 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 this is the mind fog that's yeah. happening. So while we're moving towards this Apollonian sort of title, title shift, the imagery we're going to be getting in some ways will be kind of counterintuitive to that. And that's mm -hmm. where we get this collective cognitive dissonance. Yep. But um, it's a really, and, and we're seeing this being played out here, right? Yeah, we've seen this played out with Kavanaugh, Blasi Ford, alcohol, and he's the least Dionysian character that you can really yeah. come up with. I mean, he like he sat he, to me. He seems like like you know the, the little boy from those like Tom and Jane books when you were younger, right? Like just like like I know, like, he's tidy whitey. Tidy Kurt Kavanaugh's a tidy whitey. Yeah, yeah. Oh boy, all right, interesting stuff as always with you, Robert. So like, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of matrix mash we'll be back to do it again next week and you can catch robert at robertphoenix.com i'm at offplanetradio.com if you want health and wellness consultation hit me up on facebook at emily moyer get a reading from robert we'll see you next time have a good one